Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Luke 11. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. So during the, uh, this time, it seems like the Lord is continually stretching us, or me, how's that, uh, more and more and more. So today, the, we, as most of you know, the printer malfunctioned. So I actually don't have a copy of my own sermon note sheets. And so I know it. And so once, years ago, most people don't know this, when we were meeting in Stevens Creek Elementary School, I actually got there, and I realized I didn't have my own sermon note sheets. I had printed out sermon note sheets for everybody else, but I opened up my Bible, um, it was probably during the Bible reading, and I realized my notes are missing. And so I had to immediately grab one of the, the small print sermon note sheets and start filling in the blanks as, as, as much as I could remember <laughs> so that I would have a crutch. Anyways, and so it's always kind of fun when, when the Lord kind of says, okay, when you're weak, I am strong, right? So this is one of those moments as well. This is probably one of, um, a, has become one of my favorite passages, as most of you know it. Um, years ago, the Lord challenged me to put together um, a series of prayer videos, um, and I fought against it for probably a couple years until COVID happened. Um, and then we started doing the, um, the Zoom videos and that kind of stuff, and I was doing things through YouTube and that kind of stuff. And so the Lord said, so what's stopping you now? And I was like, oh, well, nothing, I, I guess I'll, I'll do it. And so, but um, for most of you know that the, the topic, if you would, of that series of prayer videos is Lord, teach us to pray. And it comes from this passage. And it's a, just a, a tender uh, moment for the disciples coming to the Lord. Over the last five weeks, we've seen Jesus give interactive instruction to his disciples, what his expectations for them were, what, um, what they would be like, what their compassions and their desires ought to be. And last week, if you remember, we looked at, at the very end, again, um, I think it was Kristen, or no, it was Shireen, you were saying how much was, um, only five verses, but how much was contained in those five verses there with Mary and Martha. And um, Martha's all concerned, consumed with the things that are going on because Mary has chosen to sit at Jesus' feet and Martha's wanting to, to make sure that everybody has food and that kind of stuff. Not necessarily bad stuff, but it, according to Jesus, it wasn't the 
best thing. It wasn't the one thing that was necessary. And so that didn't happen in a vacuum. That didn't happen um, apart from everybody else. I want you to think about when that rebuke, when that uh, verbal chastening, when that instruction would have been given. Because Martha comes to who? Jesus. Where would Jesus have been at that moment? In the midst of everybody else, right? And so it's not just Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, but there would have been a crowd sitting at Jesus' feet. And I submit to you that probably these 12 disciples of Jesus were sitting at Jesus' feet, or at least around about, and they heard the rebuke. And so I find it interesting that the next thing we're now told by Luke is a tender moment where the disciples potentially have heard that rebuke, and they're applying it. There's only one thing that's necessary, and Mary has what? She's chosen it. What was the thing that was necessary that she chose? To sit at Jesus' feet. To have fellowship with the Lord. Now, the disciples, over the, the course of their discipleship, if you would, being with Jesus, right, they have noted that Jesus does something very often. What is that? He goes off by himself to pray. Now, I don't know if he's always going off by himself, but many times he's gone off by himself. In fact, um, we know from the very beginning when Jesus had ministered in the, the synagogue at Capernaum, and that evening he winds up healing a bunch of people, right? You remember that? And he was at um, Peter's house, and he heals um, Peter's mother-in-law, and then all the people bring in the sick and the the, um, the demon possessed to him, and so he's healing all them. And it's a long night, but we're told the, the next morning, before it was yet day, Jesus did what? He went off and prayed. When Peter and the, all, everybody else woke up, what? They couldn't find him. He wasn't there. They had to go look for him. And when they found him, they found him praying. Okay, So Jesus... Prayer was very important to him. And so here it is, after this time, we're not told exactly where, but Jesus now is spending time in prayer again. The disciples see him. The disciples recognize it, okay? And the disciples are going to come, and they're going to ask this question. So the very first part that we see, again, very, very brief, but still the request of the disciples is, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. And two things I want to just briefly bring out in that that I think it's very important. First of all, the disciples recognized the importance of prayer and they wanted to learn how to do it. The disciples, so the subject, if you would, of the request, the disciples recognized the importance of prayer and they wanted to learn how to do it. The theme of this whole message is going to be on prayer, but it's also going to be on the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God as we come through this, right? Um, as we pray. But I want to ask you, as I asked myself, and this really started that journey of all those videos, how important is prayer really to you? How important is prayer really to you? You might have been saved 40 years. You might be saved four years. You might have been saved four minutes. The question is still the same. How important is prayer to you? And do you want to know how better to pray? What is prayer? Most of you have been here long enough, you should know my book answer, right? What's my book answer? Say it louder. Talking to God. Talking to God. It's communication with God. I like to add in worship. Communication with God in worship. Okay? It's a recognition of who He is. But He's given us the privilege to go before Him. It's having a conversation with my Abba, with my Daddy with my father, who we'll talk about in just a moment, okay? So, this is an important thing. How important is it to you? The disciples began to realize that it must be what? Important. So they want to know how to pray. So they go to the rabbis. They go back to the temple. They talk to the priests. They talk to the scribes. It's not where they went. Where did they go? They went to Jesus. When you want to learn more about something, a spiritual discipline, 
Where do you turn? Do you turn to commentaries? Do you turn to your favorite um, expositor? Do you ask me? I'm just joking. Where should you turn? To the Lord. You should turn to Jesus. Again, as Steve shared earlier, this book is the Word of God, which means it's the Word of truth. Jesus told us when we make disciples, after we baptize them, immerse them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, what are we supposed to do? Teach them. Teach them what? Everything that he taught us. We're supposed to point them to this word. Jesus said to his disciples, it's profitable for you for me to leave. Because if I leave, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to do what? Remind you of the things I taught you and to lead you into all truth. The reality then is if you want to learn how to pray, it's not my prayer videos. Which I think are good. But still, that's not the ultimate source of learning how to pray. My goal in those prayer videos is to point people to back to the Word of God. Lord, teach us to pray. So I want to just challenge you as we get into this. Do you really want to know? Do you want to know how to pray? Do you really want to know if you're praying wrong? Do you really want to know if you're praying selfish? Do you really want to pray as Jesus wants us to pray? That's going to take time. That's going to take effort. That's going to take a commitment. But are you willing to do that? So, the request of the disciples to know how to pray, but then we have the teaching of Jesus. And we're going to get to the main part in a moment, but the first part of his teaching was what? This is a no-brainer sitting right in front of you. Say it again. No, not before we get there. That's the model prayer. How did Jesus teach them first and foremost? I heard it. Say it louder. His example, his lifestyle. They were coming to Jesus to ask him to teach them to pray because they had seen him what? Praying. If you're growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you're young in the faith and you want to learn, the place to go to learn how to pray to the Lord, yes, in his word, but then to the place where people are praying. I remember when I was first saved, and I, I don't mean, I really don't mean this as prideful. I really don't. But on Wednesday nights, it was the typical um, church prayer meeting, which means they didn't pray much. They had a Bible study. And then they pray a little bit at the end. We do things a little bit different here. We want prayer meeting to be a prayer meeting. And so I wanted to learn how to pray. And so I asked two older men in the congregation back then if they would give me, meet with me on another night to teach me how to, to pray. And I thank God for Dick Corder um, and, and Tom Ruckman. Both are with the Lord right now. Rucker. Rucker, not Ruckman. Rucker. Yeah, Tom Rucker. Um, for doing that. For, for taking Thursday nights for almost a whole year and spending time with Bob Corbin just so that we could pray. And I could learn from two older saints what it meant to have a relationship with my God and to have time and conversation with him. And so I want to, again, challenge you in that, okay? From that, Jesus taught with his lifestyle. If you want discipleship, get with somebody who will be able to teach you from their lifestyle. Don't wait for them to ask you hey, do you want me to, because that's prideful. If you want it, you go ask them. And I promise you, there are a lot of men who would love to invest their life in a younger believer. They're just waiting to be asked. Okay, his lifestyle. Secondly and foremost then, what we're going to be talking about is his instruction, right? So the first part of his instruction is the model prayer. Many times referred to as the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer. But if you really want to read the Lord's Prayer, Go to John chapter 17. That is the Lord's Prayer. 
That is when he is praying for his disciples and praying for you. This is not the Lord's Prayer. This is the Lord's model prayer. This is what he's giving them as an example when they said, teach us to pray. He's saying, well, this is kind of how you're going to do it. This is not the prayer that he prayed all the time. Rather, in Matthew chapter 6, he said, don't pray with vain repetitions. In other words, don't be saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not just quoting those things. And I did it every Sunday growing up in the, in the church that I grew up in. We said our, our fathers. We, we quoted the Lord's Prayer. And then the, the, the pastor would give us absolution of all of our sins because he had that authority. That's not biblical. That wasn't what was true. This is just a model prayer. So as we look at this model prayer then, we look and say, okay, so what are the pieces, what are the parts that Jesus is teaching his disciples that ought to be somewhat part of your prayer life? Well, first of all, you have the address. Who did Jesus say that you should address your prayer to? God most high, the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's not what he said, is it? Your father. Your father, who's where? In heaven. Now, I know some of yours leaves out the, um, the R and it leaves out the, the in heaven. It just says father. Um, but many of the Greek um, translations have our father, who's in heaven. Or, if you would, our heavenly father. On earth, you have an earthly father. You have one who is your progenitor, one who has brought you into the world and can take you right back out. Anyways, but the reality is you have a what? A heavenly father. Now, I want to shade, shade this in two ways for you real quick. I want to submit to you, not a universalism thing here, but I want to submit to you that God is the heavenly father of every single individual on the face of the earth. Because God, God is the one who gives life. Your earthly progenitor may have been the one who thinks he brought you into the world, but the reality is that life is a gift from, from God. Okay, So God is the one who has brought every single individual into the world. And he loves every single person that he's brought into the world. In fact, he sent Jesus to die on the cross for every single individual that he has brought into the world. He desires to have fellowship with every single one of the children, if you would, that he's brought into the world. That's why abortion is an abomination before him. It's taking life that he has brought into the world. God is the Father. However, there is the, the highlighted phase of it, and that is that God is the Father of those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so we're told in Galatians chapter 4 that Christ became the payment of our sins. He was born under the law, born, on, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law in order that we might receive what? The adoption, adoption of sons, whereby we have the spirit in us that cries out, Abba, Father. Abba is the Aramaic word, which means, come on, y'all back there, wake up, Father, Daddy, Daddy, it means Daddy, okay? And so we have this privilege of not just looking at God as Father, as the creator of the heavens and the earth, which he is, and it's important to remember, but also as our, our daddy, my heavenly daddy, who loves me and cares for me. So, his position, he's my daddy, he's my father, his location, he's in heaven. Now we get into this section of appeals. And I, I want to point out to you that these are appeals. These are all in the imperative mood. And the imperative mood is um, telling you something that's very, very important if it's from a higher to a lower, it is a command. It's not a choice. It's not a plea going from the a person above to the person below, but rather it's a command. So when God gives us something in the imperative mood, 
It's telling us we have to do it. It's not requesting us to do it. But when it's from a lower, well, let's just go equal to equal. It's an exhortation. You can do this. You can do this. But when it goes from a lower to a higher, it's begging. It's pleading. And so we have pleading going on here that Jesus tells us that we ought to be doing in our prayers. And there are five, if you would, please, six, but I'm combining two of them together because I don't know how else to do that. Five pleas that I'm going to put out to you here. And the first plea is the plea for sanctification. Because the first thing he says is when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father, who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Literally is, a cha- it's a, a plea for his name to be sanctified. I desire for your name to be sanctified. Can I ask you if that's the first thing that you pray for when you pray? Are you thinking about God's name being set apart? Are you thinking about God being seen as holy, holy, holy? Turn with me to Exodus, um, well, let's go to um, Leviticus 10. And while you're going there, remind you of Exodus 20, verse 7, because you know that. That's part of the Ten Commandments. It's the third of the Ten Commandments. Does anybody know what that is? You shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. Well, Leviticus chapter 10 is not a pleasurable um, place for us to read, but it's an important place for us to read. In Leviticus chapter 10, we read about Nadab and Abihu offering up a profane sacrifice. And so um, I submit to you that they had been drinking, and so they're, they weren't thinking straight. They grabbed um, incense, and they offered to God as they shouldn't have offered. As God said not to do it, they did it. And so God sent fire, verse 2, fire went out from Yahweh and devoured them, and they died before Yahweh. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Herein lies the balance. He's my Abba. He's my Daddy. There is a special relationship that's there. But he still is who? He's still God. And he's still holy, holy, holy. And he's not to be treated with disdain on our behalf when we go before him. People don't understand this sometimes. But there are blessings and there are curses. And there are things that happen because I'm not treating God properly. I'm not going to come into an individual's life and tell them that. But I can tell you in my own life, there are times when God has rebuked me. Because I have not treated him as holy. He is not my bud. He is my Abba. He is my daddy. But he is God. And he is to be treated as holy. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. It says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, I do not I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, says Yahweh Elohim, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. God declares that I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to punish you and I'm going to do this thing because you have profaned my name. The Gentiles are profaning my name because of your actions. And so, this punishment is coming upon you in order that every white one may know that my name is not to be profaned. It is a great and holy name not to be profaned. So again, I ask you, 
as you go to Yahweh in prayer, do you care about his name? Do you care whether he is holy, holy, holy? Do you care whether he's being treated as holy, holy, holy? Do you care whether you are treating him as holy, holy, holy? And if you don't, that says a whole lot about your relationship with him. It tells me about the attitude that you have with God. And remember, Bob's not judging you. The person sitting next to you isn't judging you. In the end, your judge is the one who created the heavens and the earth and who gave you life. He is your judge. So as I come to, in prayer, there ought to be this desire to be able to, to see God as holy, holy, holy. So, a plea for sanctification, which is the recognition and remembrance that God is holy. Holy, holy. And one last quick statement on that with Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah sees God high and lifted up and the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. Why do they say that? Why do they say holy, holy, holy? Does anybody remember why? Because in the Hebrew, that's how you show the superlative. Something's holy, you say holy. If it's more holy, you say it's holy, holy. If it's the most holy, then you say holy, holy, holy. That's why Jesus said, truly, truly, I say unto you. Not because he's just being redundant when he speaks, but in the Hebrew vernacular, he's saying, this is really true. So, God is the most holy. And he ought to be treated by those who know him as the most holy. So, the first plea is a plea for sanctification. May your name be sanctified. Secondly, is a plea for submission. Where he then says, in, in Luke 11, he says, Your kingdom come your will be done. Again, I was going to separate this out, but I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm going to separate this out. They both go down in my book as submission. This is both a submission thing. And I have to ask myself, when I pray, am I praying for God's kingdom happen and his will to happen, or do I really want my kingdom established and do I really want my will to be done? Do I want what I want or do I want what God wants? Do I want to see my reign, my power, my, my, my kingdom, if you would, increased? Or am I praying about God's kingdom and about his will? And so Jesus says, when you come in prayer, you ought to be pleading, pleading, begging God. Think about this. Begging God for his kingdom to come. Begging God for his will to be done. And then we know from Matthew, on earth as it is in heaven, that we want to see his will accomplished on this earth, and that we want to see his kingdom be established on this earth. If I pray like that, I want you to think about this. If I pray like that, if I pray for God's kingdom to be coming on this earth, what am I really praying? I'm praying for people to get saved. I'm praying for his kingdom to be expanded. And if I'm praying that way, and I'm, I'm praying to become in submission to that, that means that I'm going to be what? Starting to get involved in that moment. Because I want to, I want, I'm pleading with God. I'm begging God that his, that his kingdom would be expanded, that his kingdom would be established. I'm praying with God. I'm pleading with God that his will would be accomplished. That means I've got to be willing to lay aside my desires, my will in order that I could come alongside his. So again, I'm asking you, what do your prayers look like so far? How do they compare to what Jesus is asking and telling his disciples that they ought to pray? You want to know how to pray? I mean, think about it. What we've covered so far, think of Jesus praying. Does this mirror Jesus' prayer, prayer so far? Or did Jesus come to the Father and say, well, God, Dad, you know... I know it's your desire for me to die on the cross, but I've changed my mind. And so I'm not looking forward to the moment. Now, we know that's true. Is that a true statement? He did. I mean, he came to the point where he wasn't looking forward to it. But in the end, he said what? Not my will, but your will be done. He didn't sit there and continue to plead and come 
think about uh, how we're going to get into. He didn't continue to beg God, plead God, fight with God, become importun- importun- in, um, importunity with God in order for God to change his mind. Rather, he presented his case and said, but not my will, but yours be done. And so I ask you, is that how you're praying? The third thing is for sustenance. Give us this day our what? Daily filet mignon. Lord, I know the people over in Africa only have rice, but I thank you that I live in America. So I'm asking for my daily hamburger. I'm asking for my daily quarter chicken. I'm asking for my... Think about it. When Jesus said to pray, he said to pray for your what? Not just pray, but what? Again, plead. Remember, these are all imperatives. These are pleadings. We act like it's a right of ours to have three meals a day with what we want to eat in those meals. But when Jesus said to pray, he said, plead for your daily what? Bread. Bread. But you know, God's gracious, even when he fed the 5,000, he gave them what? He gave them fish too. He didn't just give them bread. Isn't that kind of cool? He didn't have to. Could have just given them bread. Because that's all we need. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Which means that apart from the mouth of God, you can live by what? Bread. Can I make a comment about these, the anti-carbohydrate people? Anyways, so, sorry. Um, I'm just saying... Jesus calls himself the bread of life, okay? That's the substance, that's the very source. And so he says, when you pray, pray for this. Pray for your daily bread, your daily sustenance. That which is going to bide you over till the next day. But as Americans, we've become, say it louder, that's good. Spoiled. Spoiled. We're spoiled. We really are. And I don't know about you, but it gets a little rough during Helene, right? And so everybody needs to have a, and I was there, I get it, so I'm not picking on everybody else, right? You want to have a generator. So why do you want to have a generator? For your refrigerator and your freezer. Because it's not only that we just have a refrigerator to have some food, but we have freezers. So we can take even more food in it, right? And so then we can also potentially cook and we have all this kind of stuff, da 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 We don't want to just have what? Bread. Or, worst case down here, grits every day. <laughs> I didn't want to have to open up those cans of green beans <laughs> with the P, P, you know, P38 and, and sit there and eat. But that's what he's asking us. Pray for a plea, a plea for your daily sustenance, right? So what's the fourth one? It's a plea for the forgiveness of sins. Oh, let me do my recognition. So a plea for submission is the recognition and remembrance that God is the sovereign king. A plea for sustenance is the recognition and remembrance that God is our provider. And then this fourth one is a plea for forgiveness of sin, the recognition and remembrance that God is our judge. God is our judge. I have to plea with him for him to forgive me. But note the caveat. This is a scary caveat. This isn't just the way Matthew puts it, but, but Luke puts it even a little bit more pointed for us. And forgive us our sins... Why? Because we also, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Are you willing to pray that prayer? Forgive me of my sins because I am forgiving everybody else who is indebted to me, who needs my forgiveness. Jesus said, so Matthew 6, right? If you do not forgive those who are indebted to you, neither will your father, what? forgive you. I want you to think about that. This is, this is true, okay? When we talk about prayer, we think, God, we think of God like the genie in the bottle, who we rub the lamp, and he comes, and we treat him like however we want to treat him, and we tell him to do whatever we want to tell him to do. It doesn't work that way. He's not your genie in the bottle. And if you're acting that way, your prayers are only going to the roof of your mouth. He's not listening. He hears you, but he's not listening. If you want God to really extend you full forgiveness, what does he tell us we need to do? Forgive others. So I submit to you, Father, 
Forgive me my sins and help me. I am struggling. Help me to learn to forgive others like you forgive me. That's okay. That's a good prayer. Because at this moment, what are you doing? You're acknowledging your, your failure and your sin and your inability. And you're asking God again, like asking him to teach you how to pray, to ask him to teach you how to what? To forgive. I promise you that's praying in the will of God and he would be delighted to teach you how to forgive. You just have to be willing to what? Learn. <laughs> and apply it. That's right. That's not easy to do. So the last one, a plea for deliverance. The recognition and remembrance that God is our protector. Two ways. First of all, from troublesome times. And do not lead us into temptation. If you've been here long enough, you know the word behind that. Um, literally means troublesome times. Okay? And so it's a, it can mean either temptation or trial. So what he's asking is for God not to lead them into a troublesome time, but rather to deliver them from the, the evil one. And so that's a good prayer request to ask because you recognize the fact that God is your protector. God is the one who will protect you from those things. Now we know, and there's a lot of verses I don't have time to go into that I encourage you to go into them if you get the sermon note sheet, okay? Is that, that God allows into our life troublesome times, but he allows them into our life for a purpose. He doesn't cause them. He doesn't bring them purposely into our life. Sometimes they're caused by our own flesh. Sometimes they're caused by the world. But when they come, God has allowed it. And when he allows it, he allows it for our good. That we know that um, there is no troublesome situation that has overtaken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful and that he will not allow you to be troubled beyond what you're able to bear, but with the troublesome situation will also make a way for you to escape. Okay? So i got to move on because I want to get to this next part, the illustration, because Jesus is now going to give an illustration of how these, this, this model prayer, if you would, plays out. And it may seem like it doesn't go together, but it fully goes together because, again, remember what I've just told you, that there really is, after the address, our Father, He now, honestly, is telling them a bunch of supplications. These are pleas. These are things that you're asking for. And so now He's going to give an illustration of someone who's going to ask something of a friend. A friend. Not an enemy. This isn't the... Uh, the Jew and the Samaritan thing, like last week. This is a friend, right? And so we see the story. And he says, Which of you, having a friend, and go to him at midnight, say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, What? Go away! Quit bugging me! Don't trouble me! We're in bed! The door's shut! My children are with me in bed! I cannot rise and give to you! Well, that's not true, because why? He's awake. <laughs> he can get up. You're woken everybody else up. So finally, the guy keeps knocking, right? And so we're told eventually the, the friend, quote unquote, is going to get up, not because he wants to, uh, to bless his neighbor, but because he wants to get rid of his neighbor. He wants to sleep. He wants to get rid of his neighbor. So, so we have this story, right? And it says, here it says, um, depending upon your, your, your version, it may say because of his persistence. It may say because of his importunity. Okay, Literally, the word means um, to be cheekish or shamelessly insisting, to be impudent, to be impudent. And so that's what Jesus is saying this individual was. He was impudent. He didn't take his answer and go away. He was cheekily persistent. He pushed until he finally got the answer he wanted. When we do child um, training classes, we re refer to this as the, the wave on the rocks or, or the, the badger moment where your, your, your child continues to what? Badger you or the wave keeps smashing against the, 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 the coast until it finally breaks free from the the rocks and breaks through, right? And so the, the kid continually says, but mommy, 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 I want that cookie. 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 And finally the mommy says what? Have the cookie and be quiet. 
Is that good parenting? No. no, not at all. We know that. But that's what Jesus is saying. That's what's happening here. And some people would turn around and say, well, this is how Je God, Jesus is telling us that we ought to pray to God. No, he's telling us not to do that. He's giving us a negative illustration. How do I know that? Because now of how he's going to apply it. And he's going to apply it to the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God. And so he comes back now and he says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and who seeks finds. And him who knocks, it will be opened to him. You don't have to badger God. God, we're told in Matthew chapter 6, right, at the end of this, God knows what you have what? You have need of. Why are you worried about it? That's like acting like the Gentiles. God knows what you have need of. And so if you ask for it, he's faithful. We're talking about the faithfulness of God here. Think about this. If you have to get something from God by nagging him and being impudent, you probably don't want it. Well, you might want it. But in the end, I assure you, you're not going to want it. If God's only given you something because you keep nagging him, it's not something that you ultimately wanted. Again, you're treating him like the genie in the bottle. You're going to keep nagging him until he does what you want to do, rather than saying, but nevertheless, not my what? Not my will, but yours be done. If God has it, I want you to think about this. We talked about this um, last week, and then especially in the evening when we talked about the good, um, the good Samaritan and the loving your neighbor. If God has something and you need it, do you think he's going to withhold it from you? No, that's the whole idea of 1 John chapter 3. If you see your brother having a need and you have it, what it needs to meet that need and you, don't, and you don't meet the need, then you don't what? You don't love him. Would we expect God to do that? Of course not. That's ludicrous. So if God has what I need, what I... Say it with me. What I need. Not what I necessarily want, but what I need. There's a lot of times when I'm praying, I'm praying for my what? My, well, my greeds. Yeah, my, my greeds, not my needs. And God is gracious, because we know, right, that sometimes God meets our what? Greeds. He gives us greeds, okay? That's okay. But if it's not a need, and God knows better, I mean, think about it. Mom, Dad, your kid's asking for all those cookies. But you know dinner time's coming up. And so you tell them what? No. Why? Because it's better for them to have the real food, the good food, before they're eating all the sugar. At the end of the meal, you'll be glad to do what? Give them a cookie. Maybe two. Maybe three. But first they got to do what? Eat the meal. <laughs> yeah? Got to finish your green beans, Bob. After you're done with your green beans, you'll get a piece of cake. Well, I didn't want cake anyway. <laughs> Isn't that how the kids act? Yeah? Kids, kids look at the thing in the plate, and they're saying, well, you get your cookie after you're done eating. They're thinking, cookie's not worth it. <laughs> cookie's not worth it. Isn't it amazing how what we thought was a need wasn't a need <laughs> when we look at those things? But if God has it, um, he won't withhold it. So then he goes on to this last part then, the last part of the second part of the application, and he says about the goodness of God now. He says, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? So dads, we're going to ask out there, right? Your son comes to you and says, dad, I'm hungry. Can I have a piece of bread? Are you going to reach down and grab my rock and say, no, son, I don't want you to eat. Here, gnaw on this for a while. Probably not. It's not going to happen that way, right? If he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? Will you give him a copperhead instead? Will you give him a, uh, what's the, come on, my brain, my water moccasin. Yeah, are you going to give him a water moccasin instead? Water moccasin instead? Of course not. Who's going to do that? If he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? I mean, these are, these are hyperboles. I get it. Jesus is purposely putting this thing out. And he's saying, so why do you act with God like that? 
Why do you think God's going to be like that? If you, being evil, know how to give good things, how much more so is your Father in heaven? How much more so is the goodness of your Father in heaven? And then he just kind of throws this last statement in, kind of like out of the middle of nowhere. It tells us the ultimate gift then is what? That you should be asking for. The Holy Spirit. So God, the Father's not going to withhold the Holy Spirit from anybody who what? Who asks? Where did that come from? That just came out of left field. That wasn't part of the model prayer. It wasn't part of the story. All of a sudden it's here at the end. I think Jesus is letting us know. I mean, because think about it. The Holy Spirit wasn't given yet to the disciples. I think this is a statement for you and me. Again, what is it that you're asking God for? What are the desires? What are the pleas? What are the, the, the insistence, if you would, yearning for God, saying, God, this is really what I want. God, this is what I want to see. Is it sanctification? Is it submission? Is it just the sustenance that you need on a daily basis? I think of Proverbs, which says, Lord, I ask you two things. Deny me not before I die. Keep lying far from me. But, but also, don't give me too much, lest I forget you. Or don't give me too little, lest I start to steal. Rather, only give me what I need on a daily basis. It's been my prayer. And he's answered it. I've never known want. I've never known necessarily bounty. But he's always met our need. Every single step of the way. Lord, protect me from myself and from the evil one. That's there. Be my provider. Be my protector. And drop all the way down. Lord, empower me with your Holy Spirit. Allow me to glorify you through my life. So in the end, where do you turn first for instruction and in righteousness? Do you turn to Christ and his word? How important is prayer to you? Or what does your prayer time generally consist of? Are you focused on your own laundry list or upon the faithfulness and goodness of God? Is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word of truth. Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow in our prayer life. Lord, help us to grow in our relationship with you. Help us to be appreciative of the privilege that we have to be able to talk to you. But Lord, help us when we come to you to understand and acknowledge exactly who you are. You are the God of the universe. You are the most high. There is no God but you. And you are holy, holy, holy. And yet you are our Abba. You are our Daddy. You have... Um, sent Jesus into the world to pay the penalty of our sins in order that we might have this privilege of coming directly before you. And so, God, I ask you, Lord, that you would continue to work in our hearts, that we would desire to be in submission to you in all things. Lord, that we would desire to see your kingdom be established on this earth and that we would desire to be laborers in the field, that we would desire, Lord, to see your will be done and not necessarily our own. Lord, that we would desire to not be uh, focus on the things that this world is focused on, that we would be content with the things that would you give us. Lord, that we would be content with our daily bread. Lord, that we would be content with your protection in our lives. And Father, that you would empower us, each of us individually, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that we might do things that the world would know only could happen if you were empowering us. I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. I thank you again for just watching over us and giving us glorious time meeting outside in the public. Lord, I pray for your wisdom and your strength as we um, seek to meet the needs of the assembly and um, working on the inside and preparing it for meeting in there. Lord, that we would be prepared for that, but not again for our own uh, desires, not for our own comfort, but Lord, that we might honor and glorify you in all things. In Christ's name, amen.